don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. On the 25th of June, 1950, the North Korean army launched a full-scale invasion into the South, attacking the South with 80,000 troops and capturing two towns along with all of the territory to the northwest of the Imjin River. In the wake of this, Western sources would have you believe that this attack was an unprovoked act of aggression. As a matter of fact, that's the official narrative adopted by the South Korean government and the United States government when the initial attack happened. To this very day, American high school history classes will teach you that it was the North who were the aggressors and that America's intervention into the war was necessary to stop the evil communists from taking away South Korea's freedom. The fact of the matter is that the Korean War began much sooner than the 25th of June, 1950. It actually began the very moments that America arrived in Seoul in 1945. There'd been a plan for some time to invade the DPRK, and in fact, uh, as President Kim Il-sung himself pointed out, that the Korean War didn't start in 1950, it started a long time before, uh, and basically from 1947, uh, the South Korean puppets uh, made raids uh, into the northern half of, the, uh, of Korea, which had become the DPRK in 1948. Uh, and by 1949, uh, that year alone, they carried out about 2,000 border raids. As noted by Dr. Hudson in the year 1949 alone, the South Korean army and police perpetrated over 2,000 documentable instances of armed incursions onto Northern Territory, including kidnappings, murders, pillaging, and arson. Leading all the way up to the war, there had been numerous border clashes all along the 38th parallel between the North and South Korean troops. Prior to the war, in April of 1948, a joint conference of political parties and organizations was hosted in Pyongyang, which was a historic joint conference featuring representatives from virtually every political party and mass organization from both the North and South Korea, with the intent of reaching an agreement to peacefully unify Korea. All of the delegates in attendance, representing the virtual entirety of Korea's political spectrum, unanimously agreed that peaceful unification and patriotic struggle were the desired policy outcomes. However, Syngman Rhee had no intention of agreeing to peaceful unification within such a context, since he had a deeply unpopular puppet government to maintain. In his New Year message in 1949, he said the following. Up to now, in the view of the international situation, we have pursued a peaceful policy. We must remember, however, that in the new year, in accordance with the changed international situation, it is our duty to unify southern and northern Korea by our own strength. And in his August visit to Washington, he made it clear that his agenda was to The march on the north is the most important task. And the following year, he delivered a speech on a U.S. military flagship where he spoke of, quote, The unification of Korea with help of armed forces. If we have to settle this thing by war, we will do all the fighting that is needed. I would wage war, but for this, American help is needed. Syngman Rhee even boasted on a number of occasions that in a war with the North, that he could capture Pyongyang inside three days' time, provided he had the support from the Americans. Uh, originally, uh, the US had planned for South Korea to invade the DPRK, but because of the weakness of the South Korean armed forces, they, they scrapped it, uh, well, revised it and put it back later. What uh, happened was that in January, 1950 there was a, a pact or agreement concluded between the US and South Korea. Uh, the US agreed to arm South Korea to give them a lot of military aid. Uh, there was a US military advisory group in South Korea which had command over the South Korean puppet army. The uh, US National Security Council met in April 1950 and it was there that the uh, final order to start the Korean War was drawn up. And in the run-up to the beginning of the war, uh, John Fuster Dulles, uh, you know, brother of Alan Dulles, and actually visited South Korea. He was there one week before uh, the war broke out. And uh, although you won't, it's hard to find this uh, picture uh, in the Western mainstream media or in academia, 
Uh, he actually visited the 38th parallel, the front line area between the DPRK and South Korea, and there's a picture of him looking at a map, finalising the war plans. And he made an extremely provocative uh, speech uh, to the South Korean uh, so-called National Assembly. I uh, can't remember the exact words, but uh, it was basically, to paraphrase it and simplify it, was something like, oh, we're, we're right behind you. Whatever you do, we're right behind you, sort of thing. Uh, that was sort of like a green light for South Korea to attack. Dulles uh, then went to Tokyo, where he met uh, uh, several uh, US commanders and uh, political figures. Uh, I think Omar Bradley, you know, US Chief of Staff was one of them. I think MacArthur. And from the 23rd of June, uh, the South Korean puppets started shelling uh, the areas uh, north of the 38th parallel. And then very early in the morning of uh, June 25th, uh, they actually attacked the DPRK all along the 38th parallel. And that's that was basically the start of the war. Following North Korea's full-scale invasion into the South, a radio broadcast coming from Pyongyang had claimed that South Korea had rejected the North's proposal for peaceful unification by leading military skirmishes into their territory and attacking several towns and villages inside the Haiju region right above the 38th parallel, and by extension provoking a northern counteroffensive. These attacks, which were carried out on Haiju, are said to have occurred early in the morning the day of the invasion. General Chung Sung Chul of the Korean People's Army recalls his personal account. Quite honestly, at the time I thought it was another of the enemy's large-scale provocations. As yet, I did not know it was going to be all-out war. While I was thinking it was just another armed incursion, there came the order from our superiors to counterattack. Only then did I realize that the enemy had started the war throughout Korea. And in an article published by China Quarterly titled, How the Korean War Began, a great deal of corroborating evidence is presented, vindicating the North side of the story. Few have cared to note that on the very day of the start of the war, the two most strategically important towns in Korea adjacent to the 38th parallel, namely Kaesong in the south and Haiju in the north, respectively were reported to have been captured by the opposing hostile forces. While the UN Commission on Korea heard the North Korean broadcast on June 25, 1950 alleging the South Korean attack on Haiju, it simply brushed aside that complaint without an inquiry and accepted South Korea's complaint of an unprovoked aggression to be true. Meanwhile, on the morning of the 25th, North Korea, in a statement which received much less attention, charged that the South had crossed the border, attacking the key town of Weju. This attack was denied by the South. And yet, by a curious coincidence, Seoul claimed later in the day that it had launched a successful counterattack in one area and one area alone, namely the Haiju region. The South Korean story of a counterattack in the Haiju region is substantiated in a large number of Western reports. The New York Times on the following day carried a story with this dateline reporting that, according to the South Korean Office of Public Information, southern troops pushing northwards had captured Haiju. The British Daily Herald quoted American military observers in Seoul as saying that the South Korean forces had penetrated five miles into the north and seized Haiju. Lieutenant Colonel Malinois was reported to have summed up the situation in the following terms. By nightfall, the 25th of June, all southern territory west of the Imjin River had been lost to a depth at least three miles inside the border except in the area of the Haiju counterattack. Similar reports were carried in the New York Herald Tribune, the Manchester Guardian, and many other British and American newspapers. And so South Korea claims that no such attack was ever carried out on Haiju before turning around and admitting that they did attack Haiju, but that they were the ones who were launching a counteroffensive in response to northern aggression, claiming that they carried out this counteroffensive from the Ongjin Peninsula late in the evening on the 25th after the North had commenced their full-scale invasion. But wait. Something doesn't quite add up here. The North claims that their invasion was a counteroffensive in response to the South's invasion of Haiju early in the morning that same day. How can this be the case if the invasion of Haiju was a response to the North's invasion? Who are we to believe? The North? The South? Well, I have yet more quotations from Gupta's article that may help us reasonably deduct who exactly is at fault. 
The North Koreans attacked the Ongjin Peninsula at 4 a.m. on the 25th of June. The peninsula was never considered defensible in case of attack, and before the day ended, plans previously made were executed to evacuate the ROK 17th Regiment. Under the circumstances, how can we explain the official broadcasts from Seoul on the 26th of June at 9 a.m. to the effect that South Korean forces in the Ongjin area entered Haiju? The hypothesis cannot be excluded that the South Korean onslaught on Haiju from the Ongjin area took place sometime before 4 a.m. on the 25th of June, and that there must have been an element of surprise in this attack. The different contingents of the 1st Infantry Division of the ROK Army were mainly posted in the general area of the town of Kaesong. According to the various official and unofficial reports, this strategic South Korean town fell into the hands of the North Korean Army between 9 and 9.30 on the 25th of June, about five hours after its invasion. So, the capture of the strategic northern town of Haiju by the South Korean 1st ROK Division contingent deployed north of Kaesung appears inconceivable, INCONCEIVABLE, as a counterattack organized by South Korean forces. In short, we may reasonably surmise that if Haiju was captured, this military offensive could only have occurred coincidentally with or earlier than the North Korean offensive against the Ongjin Peninsula. Kronikar Gupta, how did the Korean War begin? And so, in conclusion, there is virtually no point chronologically that the South Korean army could have launched their counteroffensive on the Haiju region after the North's full-scale invasion into the South. On the contrary, all present evidence seems to suggest that South Korea's counteroffensive actually happened before the North's full-scale assault on the 25th of June, just as the radio broadcast originating from Pyongyang seems to suggest. Looks like the Reds were the ones telling the truth, after all. Let's talk about the significance of Haiju as a strategic target. Why would the South single out and attack Haiju? One possible reason could be because Haiju is a large manufacturing center that produced a number of essential heavy industry goods for the North, such as gold, iron, electricity, cement, and various industrial chemicals as well. And though this is true, this is not the only possible motivation behind the attack. Remember when I mentioned earlier how Syngman Rhee repeatedly bragged that he could defeat the North and take Pyongyang inside three days' time? Well, located inside the Haiju region just so happens to be the only functioning railway junction above the 38th parallel that leads directly to Pyongyang. And so, for the South to capture the Haiju region would also mean that the South would have a straight shot to quickly lay siege to the capital of North Korea. And this is probably what Syngman Rhee had in mind with all things considered. Within this context, the North's full-scale invasion into the South could be seen as an escalation of an ongoing conflict rather than an unprovoked act of aggression. Even if it is true that the North were the ones who started the war, they would be completely within their right to do so considering the fact that they are the legitimate governments of the land and it is the United States that are the ones illegally occupying and intruding on the territory of another sovereign nation.